uh, on in uh, Northrop uh, in the Crosby Seminar Room. And uh, thank you to all of you who are attending this conference and here today. I'm Jennifer Dunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And before I introduce our program for today, I'm just going to make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one is that next week, at Thursdays at 4, we will be back in the Crosby Seminar Room in Northrop for Emily Apter's talk, Not Translated, Not Equivalent, Incommensurate, Rethinking Units of Comparison and Comparative Literature. So I'll look for you there next Thursday. Uh, also, there's another Thursdays at 4 program the week after spring break, March 26th that uh, people who are interested in global politics might be interested in. It's called Global Politics. <laughs> and uh, it, it involves Michael Linick, who's a uh, um, retired US Army um, person, senior defense policy analyst, and Ron Krebs from the political science department. So we'll hope, we hope you will join us then. I also want to make, uh, uh, make you see that there is a great uh, flyer coming around. For those of you who don't know about and are eligible, i.e. your grad students, uh, you probably want to know that there is an interdisciplinary graduate group in Holocaust, Genocide, and Mass Violence. And this gives you a schedule of some of their activities and you're cordially invited to come and participate. Uh, and finally, uh, one more IAS announcement. Uh, put on your calendars that there will be a symposium April 8th through 10th. Uh, the John E. Sawyer Seminar will be um, holding a symposium called The Once and Future River, Imagining the Mississippi in an Era of Climate Change. So I encourage you to attend that. Our, talk t our panel today will be talking about the Ukraine conflict, contested past, and contested present. And the latter is, you might notice, part of the name of this two-day international symposium on social memories and human rights in post-communist Europe. Um, this is a collaborative venture of many campus units led by the, the Research and Creative Collaborative called Reframing Mass Violence. And for the last two years, Reframing Mass Violence has been exploring the particular developments and transnational entanglements of social memories in societies revisiting their, their legacies of dictatorship, state terror, and grave human rights violations. And, and the collaborative examines the reinterpretation and reframing of the atrocities themselves and the transnational justice models that have been adopted in the aftermath. So I'd like to, I said this is an effort of a huge number of units on campus, and I'd like to just list them briefly and say thank you so much. It, it gives me a thrill when I see all of us coming together uh, to support something so important. So thanks to the Human Rights Program and the Institute of the Institute for, for Global Studies, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the Center for Austrian Studies, the Department of Political Science, the Department of History, the Center for Jewish Studies and European Studies Consortium, as well as the Institute for Advanced Study. Okay, I'm going to introduce the moderator, Mary Curtin, and she will introduce the panel. Dr. Mary Curtin is the diplomat in residence, I love that title, at the Humphrey School here at the University of Minnesota. She earned her PhD in history from Columbia University, where she wrote her dissertation on Hubert Humphrey and the politics of the Cold War. She earned a master's in strategic studies from the US Army War College, and she served for 25 years as a foreign service officer for the US Department of State in Washington, in Europe, in Africa, and in Latin America. Among the many issues that she has worked on, uh, there are ones that you will recognize as significant, the Middle East peace process, human rights and democratization, non-proliferation, NATO, European Union security cooperation, and NATO efforts in Afghanistan. As a political counselor in Warsaw she, for four years, from 2004 to 2008, and I might add, she speaks Polish, French, and Spanish, she led engagement, US engagement with Poland on issues including the support for the Ukraine and Georgia's struggling democracy. So you can see that she is well positioned to be uh, the moderator and, and commentator. 
commentator for today's panel. Dr. Curtin. just for a couple of minutes so that our real experts here can um, uh, take us to the heart of the subject. Um, the, the case of Ukraine is different from the other cases that we've talked about today because we previously have been talking about how um, societies and countries use cultural memory and history and national myths and how especially related to mass violence, to conflict, and we are talking about how societies are dealing with something that took place in the past. And to, in, this, in this session, we turn to the issue of a current ongoing conflict, despite several ceasefires that have been signed, um, the, the case of, of Ukraine. I think one question that might be worth examining and that occurred to me in listening to the other panels today is whether the collective memories and stories and historical narratives that each side to this conflict use are propelling the conflict, are, are actually causing some of the problems, or simply being instrumentalized to justify actions that are based on more present day you know, political and economic goals and realities. For Ukraine, but also for Russia, I think it's also important to pose um, a form of the question or the reverse of the question that Matti um, Utila raised this morning, which is how can or should the events such as the Ukrainian famine or Holodomor um, or Ukraine's, as well as Ukraine's struggle for a national identity, how can those issues be examined without excusing or ignoring the dark side of some of the nationalist movements in Ukraine that one of our speakers will address. I think. The subject for this session, as I said, is essentially the subject of the entire con conference, contested past, contested present, but applied to the specific case of Ukraine and to the case of a conflict where the difficulties in finding a resolution to it are very specifically related to how many of the parties see the event having unfolded based on the narratives that they bring to the story. Um, and that makes it very difficult to resolve because if you present the conflict as arising from the West trying to encircle Russia to destroy the unity of the Slavic people, then that makes it very hard to come to a conclusion that leaves an independent and unified Ukraine that has a right to make its own decisions, including associating with the European Union. Um, we have uh, three speakers, um, John Paul Himka, uh, who will address the history behind the conflict, uh, George Lieber, who will discuss the 2013 to 2015 Ukrainian revolution, which one can almost say is ongoing, and the Russian response, and Brian Atwood, who will give a U.S. perspective on the current conflict, which is a little different from most of the speakers today because he will be talking about you know, current policy and not sort of how are the previous memories um, and history being addressed. Um, so the first speaker will be John Paul Himkus, Himka, who is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Alberta. So we have one speaker who came here and thinks it's warm, and one who came from Alabama and thinks it's cold. <laughs> so um, he still teaches courses on East European history and the history of the last 10 years. He's written four books on Ukrainian history and also edited or co-edited uh, seven other books, among them Bringing, Dark, Bringing the Dark Past to Light, The Reception of the Holocaust in Post-Communist Europe. Um, and some of you may have been at his keynote speech uh, last night. Um, he has been working for a number of years on a study of Ukrainian nationalists' involvement in the Holocaust. Many of his articles, as well as conference papers on the, the traumatic issues of the 20th century Ukrainian history, 
are on the website academia.edu, and that's in the program that you have. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn this over. Um, and, um, let, and so what we'll do is we'll have our three speakers and then opportunity for question and discussion after all of the speakers have finished. Okay? Can you introduce all the speakers? No, I'll do you as, as okay. you come up then. That's, and, and I think especially the large. <laughs> <laughs> the map has disappeared. Oh, it's better. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, I, I thought I would clarify that although I'm going to be speaking on how history sort of shaped the uh, regional conflict within Ukraine, I'll be speaking about historical memory contributes to the regional conflict in Ukraine. But first, I want to make absolutely clear that I think the overriding issue here in the Ukraine conflict, as we call it in our, uh, our panel, is that it is Putin's very aggressive foreign policy, which is creating a uh, tragedy that's unfolding right now. And um, the my topic has to be understood as a sort of specialized topic within a larger uh, framework. And uh, let me start with uh, uh, a story, which is that one of the most dramatic events of this conflict were beginning to unfold when uh, the Euromaidan was beginning to uh, you know, burn tires and, uh, and eventually tried to storm buildings. And when, and when the snipers killed about 100 uh, Ukrainian activists, and when uh, Yanukovych was chased out, and, and when uh, Russia invaded Crimea and took it, and all these events were going on, I happened to be teaching a, a course on, on uh, 20th century, not 20th century, but modern. East European history. So it was natural that the students would begin to ask my opinion or, or, or my explanation of what was going on in an area in which they knew I had some expertise, which is Ukraine. And uh, I was, for reasons that might become apparent, I'm very reluctant to give any, any discussion of my views on this situation. Uh, but one of the students, a very bright guy, a very nice guy, uh, said, well, Who's out there in that Maidan? He says, I see that there are anarcho syndicalists out there. An anarcho syndicalists out there. And I thought, geez, he's well informed. I have a friend, Ukrainian anarcho syndicalist. He's out, <laughs> he's out in the Maidan. I know, you know all three members of his my, my minuscule group letter are probably out there on the Maidan. How does this, this Alberta boy of Metis origin? which is like mixed Indian uh, European. Uh, how does he know this? I said, how do you know that the anarcho syndicalists are out there? He says, I see them out there by the sea of red and black flags on the Maidan. <laughs> so I thought, that's really, that. I, I had to laugh because actually what he's seeing are not anarcho syndicalist flags, but the flags of the party flags of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, Bandera faction, the black and red flags that they that they had, which are your typical sort of, let's call it radical right, blut und boden, boden, you know, blood and soil, the red for the blood, the nation, and the soil for the territory, which, and the two should really mix, right? Um, so uh, I, I disabused him of his notion. I also pointed out that if you looked under my Don photos, you could see lots of pictures of the leader that faction of the Ukrainian nationalists, Stepan Bandera, that there are huge portraits of him on the Maidan. And this whole sort of myth of the Ukrainian nationalists was being uh, very prominent within the optics of the Euro Maidan. And I have to hear say that uh, uh, why it was difficult for me was I was very not, not enthusiastic about this. Uh, one reason, and this is a bit of a personal disclosure so you know how to place my remarks. One reason is, is as Mary mentioned, I had been working for years on the study of Ukrainian nationalists and the 
Holocaust. And in the course of my research, I, I conclude, at least to my satisfaction, uh, things which I really didn't want to find out, which is that uh, Ukrainian nationalists were deeply involved. Uh, the militia of the Bandera faction, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, was the most prominent organization in the pogroms that swept Western Ukraine in 1941, summer of 1941. I also found them involved in a number of other mass killing projects that went on in the summer of 1941. Then I found out that they deliberately infiltrated the uh, German, the, the Ukrainian police force and German service, and in that capacity were involved on, in the roundup and murder of hundreds of thousands of uh, Jews in Ukraine. Uh, and then I found out that the armed forces of the organization, Ukrainian nationalists, was in fact involved in sort of routine murder of Jews when they were killing the Polish inhabitants of the region, and that in the winter of 1943-44, when the Red Army was approaching the borders of Poland, that the, that the, the, the Ukrainian uh, insurgent army was luring Jews out of the bunkers in the woods of Poland and massacring them systematically. So, in addition to, to what I knew, but because of what I knew, I had earlier in 2010 uh, been arguing very vocally within the, as long as the Ukrainian press in the United States and, and Canada would allow me to publish, which was not very long, uh, but in Ukraine much longer into deep into 2010, uh, arguing that these people have no place in, uh, in the Ukrainian identity project. We don't need a Ukraine that glorifies these people. So to see all this on the Maidan was a, was a real problem for me. Um, and like when my, when my cousin, a very, very nice guy, I love him very much, my cousin Vasily. But when he greets me this summer with, with the slogan, glory to Ukraine, I can't respond. You know, glory to the heroes like I'm supposed to. Because I know where this slogan comes from. It comes from the time when everybody, like the Ustasha, what did they have? It was something I'm always ready or... Uh, so don't spray me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, the, the, there was this, this moment when people adopted these kind of, and that's where it comes from. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. And, uh, and in fact, that very summer when I was being greeted so by my cousin, uh, Vasil, I was also doing research uh, on, uh, on, uh, in my project and found uh, a whole series of reports from local uh, Bandera movement uh, security forces where every couple of weeks they would report on the people they had killed for political suspicion or in general causing uh, you know, political suspicion was the main one, theft was the other. They would court and court martial these people and just, and just murder them. They would put a little report of who they killed and why. And at the end of it, they would always write, glory to Ukraine. So it's very hard for me, very hard for me to take that. What's, what's reasonable about this is that that movement grew up and was concentrated in only a specific region of Ukraine. It's this, yeah, it's showing up here. And that's the Galician region, which is the Lviv Oblast, Ternopil Oblast, and ivano Frankivsk Oblast. So specifically, uh, Galician uh, experience, Galicians that from that region of Ukraine promoted it as an ideal, but by this time it's kind of a mental regionalism because many people from outside that region have embraced this ideology, um, but in which the central experience is the Galician uh, and nationalist experience. Uh, and it's become now a prominent part in the Ukrainian uh, identity project as it's unfolding. And, and there are reasons why this, why this movement came up in Galicia, and maybe the best way to explain that would be to explain where it never managed to hold, take hold, or at least historically never managed to take hold. And that would be in the south of Ukraine, the south, the south of Ukraine, and the east of Ukraine. Um, so, In Galicia, which was under Austro, uh, it was in the Habsburg monarchy, in the Austrian part of the Habsburg monarchy, 
I would say the main kind of politics of the day were nationalist politics. You know, the Czech-German conflict, the uh, 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 conflicts in Slovenia over a, 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 a Slovenian language schoolhouse, governments could fall over this. It was the stuff of politics. There was a large Ukrainian-Polish conflict being waged, right in those kind of nationalist terms. Uh, and this, when uh, uh, Austria-Hungary fell and Poland took Galicia, that national conflict continued. There was a uh, small insurrectionary movement, assassinations. Politics in Galicia were very, very uh, based on questions of nationality. While in the south of eastern Ukraine, where for a very long time uh, it was under Russian rule, you didn't have nationality politics he almost had no politics, period. I mean, there were national politics and national prejudices. You know, if people didn't like Jews or they didn't like Poles or they didn't like Ukrainians or they didn't like Russians. You know, but just ordinary prejudices. They weren't actually politicized as the kind of uh, a way it became uh, in Galicia. So that, in fact, there was very little politics in the Russian Empire because uh, they had a very brief period of any kind of sort of semi-democratic representative uh, institutions. And the Soviet Union, I dare say, was not a place for a variety of politics. So less political, uh, less national. Uh, they weren't as exclusivist as the, uh, as the uh, Galicians had been. The Galicians, uh, on principle, might not speak Polish speak Ukrainian or sign their name in Ukrainian, change their spelling of their name so that it wasn't a Polish transliteration. Uh, very clear distinction between them, Poles, and us. Well, in this Eastern Ukraine, there was a lot of intermarriage, a lot of, uh, not, such a, not such a feeling of distance. Uh, not exclusivist. The historical experience of the 1930s, which is crucial to understanding the development of uh, subsequent events was very different. Galicia was part of Central Europe. It was in that orbit where uh, a lot of people were picking up ideas that um, were either fascist or fascist. Let me just let me remind you how popular uh, not only National Socialism was in Germany and fascism was in Italy, but also in Spain how popular it was, right? And uh, not there, it didn't, it, it had, there was a civil war over these issues. Um, Romania, great, great thinkers like Mirce Aliande, Emil Chana, were in the uh, Iron Guard, sort of fascist leaning movement. Um, Paul de Man, Heidegger. I mean, fascism was actually very attractive. And that's the thing we, we don't like to think about it that way. But read this stuff, read the literature, read, look at the art, you know, look at the film. Yeah, it was, and it appealed to our notions of self-sacrifice, things larger than you, and we know from the recruitment of the Islamic State what, the, what a powerful formula those kind of things are. So Galicia was exposed to this, and naturally their kind of frustrated political ambitions took on that kind of coloration. You know what I didn't do is I didn't notice what time I began to speak. Um, you started at Yeah, I can see where the problem is. And of course, in, by comparison, in, in the 19, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to mine. And, and in the 1930s, uh, in the Soviet Union, there was a period of intense political repression, moreover, a time of famine and economic difficulties. And they were not developing some kind of palingenesis of the nation. They were barely surviving. They were lucky they got their potatoes. They were lucky they got their bread. Uh, then I would say that the other very important thing to realize is that Western Ukraine is Ukrainian speaking. It's the only part of Ukraine that is primarily Ukrainian speaking. Most of the rest of Ukraine is Russian speaking. And, uh, and that means that in the south and, the, and in the east in particular, which have been longest under under Russian rule, you will meet people who can speak, who can maybe understand your Ukrainian, but not necessarily my Ukrainian, which is, uh, not, you know, it's, it's, I was raised in uh, North America. Uh, but people who, who can't speak Ukrainian, 
and they have some difficulties, they naturally gravitate to a Russian language discourse. And that means primarily for most people watching television. It means watching a lot of Russian television. So they are in this discourse which keeps <coughs> you know, their view of World War II is one. It's the same one Putin has because they all have exactly the same view of these things. They get the view on, on uh, Ukrainian nationalism that Putin puts forward. It creates a discourse community. And I would say, I have a student now finishing his dissertation on Moldova. And he noticed that, uh, the, uh, that by doing interviews across social classes, even across geographical boundaries between Transnistria and Moldova, Russian speakers <coughs> had different political views than Romanian speakers in these places. And in the Russian discourse, a lot of the people believe that the Romanians <coughs> were sort of natural fascists. Uh, and this kind of uh, mindset was very important in the East End. Um, and the discontent that was triggered by in the Euromaidan, I think the biggest fact, fa factor of the discontent of the East, not necessarily and definitely not in its, in its uh, mobilization as an armed force and as a, a full-fledged separate movement, was against Bandera, fascists, Past of the uh, the past of the Ukrainian nationalist movement, and uh, it has a lot to do with World War II. The South and East people fought in the Red Army. Their grandfathers fought in the Red Army. Everybody loves their grandfather. In the West, a lot of people fought in formations that were fighting the Red Army, either in the Waffen SS unit Galician, in police units in the Ukrainian insurgent army. Sometimes they fought in the Red Army and in one of these other units. Uh, the, the, and, uh, but in the West, in, in Galicia, developed a cult of those who didn't fight, who fought the Red Army. Because in fact, the uh, organization of Ukrainian nationalists and Ukrainian insurgent army, after they were done with the World War, began a large scale insurgency against the Red Army which was brutally, brutally repressed. And that is not bitter memories. Uh, so they're totally at um, uh, loggerheads on this issue. And I think that that is the tinder that, that, that set off the, the spark that set off the tinder. And because I know I'm really supposed to end, I'm going to go right to some conclusions which are not in my uh, written paper. But it seems that what's happening now is a con consolidation of a new kind of Ukrainian identity. Um, with the prominence of the nationalist uh, heritage on the Euromaidan itself, uh, that's one of the things that has really pushed towards a, um, a unified belief in the, in the, in the, in the mythic uh, uh, importance of the Bandera movement. You know, you go to the view, like I went this summer, Bandera Coffee, Bandera Excursion Bureau, Bandera Horilka, and Vodka. Uh, people gave it to me as gifts, knowing my special love for the Bandera movement. <coughs> it's everywhere. There's even, believe it or not, a Waffen SS uh, Galician uh, uh, taxi company in, in the city. So it's, this is now hegemonic in, in, in these regions. And the government of Ukraine uh, has totally delivered the means of memory socialization into the hands of people who are glorifying the nationalist myth. So, uh, for example, the Minister of Education, Sergei Kvit, is a man who wrote his uh, dissertation, an admiring dissertation of the Ukrainian, uh, I, I don't think you know, the Ukrainian nationalist, the fascist figure, Dmitry Donsov. Uh, he wrote down, he's intervened to uh, save a plaque for uh, the uh, uh, Bandera movement uh, um, uh, high leader uh, Yaroslav Stefko, who also has personal responsibility for the, uh, some of the pogrom activities in 1941. Uh, and, uh, and he's now developing a national education plan 
with the patriotic education of, of Ukrainian youth. Uh, the Institute of National Memory is now headed by uh, Volodymyr Vyotrovich, who made his career as a young historian precisely by uh, denying, uh, uh, denying uh, the crimes of the nationalists and by glorifying their insurgency. Uh, the head of the security services in Ukraine is uh, Valentin and uh, he had been the head of security service under President Yushchenko earlier. He also uh, uh, had press conferences and public hearings that uh, uh, denied that the OUN could have, had, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists could have ever been involved in anti-Jewish atrocities, and he uh, even uh, was responsible for. Uh, creating a list of perpetrators of the famine of 1932-33, which just happened to have 40% of the perpetrators be Jewish. So these are the people now who control memory socialization in Ukraine. So I would say, you know, I've resigned from the culture wars here, or the political culture memory wars, because they've won. So on the one hand, uh, it was in Ukraine. But on the other hand, what's interesting to me is that uh, there's been a shift on what they're willing to cave in on, and that is on language. It had been the case that the Western Ukrainians and the whole Galician model had insisted on Ukrainian language and that Russian speakers were uh, potentially disloyal to the Ukrainian state. You're in Ukraine, speak Ukraine. First thing that Maidan did when they chased out the old legislators and put in their new legislators was revoke laws of the previous regime which had given a place for Russian within the administration. There we go. And then they had to restore them. And now, lots of the leaders of the Ukrainian right are actually Russian speakers. And, and two of the people I just mentioned are, uh, are people who grew up in Russian-speaking environments, uh, the Minister of Education and the head of the security uh, uh, services. So uh, Russian language has been accepted. So the marker, of, the linguistic marker has been, has been uh, uh, traded for the historical uh, memory, uh, World War II marker. Then too, this consolidation has been facilitated by the high, hiving off of the most pro-Russian regions of Ukraine. Crimea had over 90% Russian-speaking population. Eastern Donbas had over 90% Russian-speaking population. Both of those regions are really lost to Ukraine right now. So that there's a, now if there's an election, there will never be a very strong vote for a pro-Russian uh, party. And uh, I'm, I'm really coming very close to the end here. Uh, I just have two points to make. Uh, the war is changing things. When, when the war in the Donbass started, I think it was, it was touch and go how far it would be able to gain sympathy among neighboring regions in the east and south. But now that the war has gone on, I think most people who might have, in the past, if it had, in the past might have been pro-Russian, pro-Putin, when they see the thuggery of the leadership of the of the Donbas republics, and when they see uh, the war and the conditions in which people in Donetsk and Tepalsara and Luhansk live after being bombed out, they don't want that. They don't want that. They want nothing to do. On the other hand, those people who are in those separatist territories, it's their civilians who are killed by the uh, missiles that Ukrainians can't, can't aim properly because nobody has the technology to, 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 to get more precise, smarter bombs like are used, uh, let's say, in Gaza or places like that. So there, they hate Ukraine. They hate Ukrainians. And that's why uh, every once in a while the, 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 the leadership of the Donbass republics march Ukrainian soldiers where people can spit at them and slap them and stuff like that. Horrible stuff. Still, the last question. It's still the, the, the nationalist legacy as the national identity. I don't know. The national legacy. This kind of mythic, uh, uh, these heroes who I feel have so much blood on their hands, you know, are they able to appropriate their uh, heritage in a way that uh, allows for a democratic, or at least a tolerant Ukraine to develop. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not optimistic. But then again, I love to be proven wrong. So thank you. Sorry.
thank you. Um, I think after listening to that, I have more questions than before, but uh, we are going to move on um, to uh, Professor George Lieber from Professor of History at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, which would be a place of significant cultural memory for the United States, especially the Civil Rights Movement. Um, he's the author of several books, including Alexander Dovshenko, A Life in Soviet Film, um, Soviet Nationality Policy, Urban Growth, and Identity Change in the Ukrainian SSR. And with Anna Mostovich, he compiled and edited Nonconformity and Dissent in the Ukrainian SSR 1955-1975. The University of Toronto Press is going to publish his next book, Upheavals, Total Wars, and the Making of Modern Ukraine, 1914-1954, which will appear next year. Um, he will be talking about the uh, 2013 to 15 Ukrainian uh, revolution and the Russian response. Um, and I will turn over the floor to him now. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? No. Thank you. Uh, in February uh, 2013, after several frustrating years negotiating with Ukraine, the European Union gave Ukraine's political leadership a November 2013 deadline to sign up to sign an association agreement with the world's largest economy. President Viktor Yanukovych, Ukraine's most pro-Russian president since independence in 1991, publicly agreed to do so. But the Russian government, which had long planned to bring Ukraine into the Eurasian Customs Union of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, sought to overturn this, this, this decision. In addition to critical articles in the Russian press and the media, Russia launched a brief customs war with Ukraine in August 2013, then threatened to introduce a visa regime for Ukrainians traveling to Russia. After several visits, by President Vladimir Putin to Kiev and President Yanukovych to Moscow, Ukraine's president announced on November the 21st, 2013, one week before the scheduled EU summit meeting in Vilnius, that Ukraine would not sign this agreement with the EU. Pro-EU demonstrations started the next day, leading to the overthrow of the Yanukovych government on February 21st, 22nd, 2014. Shortly after that, uh, there's uh, an invasion, of, uh, the Russian invasion of the Crimea, a separatist, separatist upsurge up, abetted by Russia in eastern Ukraine, and increased tensions between the European Union and the United States on the one hand, and the Russian Federation on the other. According to the United Nations, over 6,000 Men, women, and children, soldiers, as well as civilians, have died in Ukraine since February 2014. Over the past two years, Russia's power elite, those men and women closely associated with President Putin, have vehemently opposed the idea of Ukraine signing this EU agreement, which would have precluded Ukraine from joining this Eurasian Customs Union. The sources of this Russian hostility to Ukraine's pro-EU pro choice are not a recent phenomenon, but a product of long-term attitudes and mental tectonic plates exacerbated by the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the USSR in 1991. So what I'll do over the next few moments is to talk uh, briefly about uh, the first kind of tectonic plate Ukraine as an existential threat to Russia. Most members of the Russian political elite uh, uh, believe, uh, or, uh, believe that uh, the idea of Ukraine as an independent nation state is an existential threat to the Russian identity. In their view of the world, Ukraine cannot exist without Russia or Russian tutelage, however one defines the term. With the development of the Ukrainian national movement, 
in the Russian and Austrian empires in the late 18th and 19th centuries, Ukraine as an actual or potential incubator of cultural and political separatism from Russia has remained an important part of the overall Russian view of the world. According to the official Tsarist interpretation, Ukrainians formed the little Russian part of the all-Russian Orthodox nation, which possessed three branches, the Russian, the Ukrainian, and the Belarusian. They spoke mutually understandable East Slavic languages, which possessed many common features, and they shared the Orthodox Christian faith. Imperial Russian authorities did not discriminate against men and women of little Russian origin who did not attempt to politicize their identity uh, and who recognized their role within this all-Russian political landscape. Russian officials, historians, and public commentators interpreted the history of Little Russia as an integral part of, the, of mainstream Russian history, and they perceived the Little Russians as Nashi, ours. In contrast, the government re repressed all individuals who demonstrated a distinct Ukrainian identity in the political or cultural sphere. The authorities considered the act of identifying oneself as Ukrainian, instead of a little Russian, as a political and anti-governmental act. So, uh, this is kind of the brief kind of story of, uh, kind of Russian imperial mentality. And what I would like to do uh, is kind of the flash forward 75 years from the start of World War I, which radically reconfigured the map of Europe by, um, by destroying the Russian and the Austro-Hungarian and the Ottoman, and as well as the German empires in Europe, and kind of set up kind of what the, set up the process by which the modern map of Europe looks like uh, today. And, um, and in terms of this, uh, you know, there emerged uh, in 1924, or 19, uh, in 1923, uh, the, the Union of, so uh, of, uh, of uh, Soviet Socialist Republics, of which the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic became uh, an important part of. And this lasted, this whole kind of political architecture lasted until uh, the late 1980s, until 1991, and when um, Mikhail Gorbachev became the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1985, he began to introduce a large number of economic and political reforms, which then unleashed a cascade of nationalist mobilizations throughout the USSR, bringing to power individuals who sought to use Soviet institutions to further the interests of their own republics. And, um, and in 1990 and 1991, the Russian Federation, the leader of the Russian Federation, Boris Yeltsin, and Ukraine's Leonid Kravchuk, both challenged Mikhail Gorbachev's leadership of the USSR. And so, uh, in December of 1991, after a long kind of struggle, the, the Soviet Union kind of disappeared, and in place of the Soviet Union, 15 independent republics emerged, the Russian Federation, the largest of them. And in the course of the 1990s, uh, Boris Yeltsin remained the, the president of the Russian Federation. And by concentrating on the interests of the Russian Federation, Yeltsin maintained, for the most part, good relations with uh, an independent Ukraine, culminating in the 1994-1996 denuclearization of Ukraine, the 1998 Russian-Ukrainian Treaty of Friendship, and the subsequent division of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet into a Russian naval fleet and to a Ukrainian naval fleet. And in this entire period of the 1990s, despite advice from uh, many of his advisors, Boris Yeltsin, the Yeltsin government, did not support the growing separatist movement in the Crimea. Uh, in fact, um, Yeltsin was much opposed to it. But, so this is Yeltsin's position in the 1990s. But 
the post-Soviet elite in the Russian Federation in the 1990s did not necessarily decolonize their minds. Many Russians referred to their closest neighbors as the near abroad and employed the term the post-Soviet space. Both terms imply that these post-Soviet nations do not constitute real Soviet, but real foreign countries. And the most important aspect which binds all of these countries together in this post-Soviet space is their common Soviet inheritance. And this is the interpretation. Both concepts imply the idea of Russia's special relationship with the newly independent uh, states of the former Soviet Union. And according to Fyodor Lukyanov, the chair of the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy and the editor-in-chief of Russia and Global Affairs, quote, Russia still believes that it is necessary to create a space around itself where it is recognized as the leader in every sense, political, economic, cultural, and ideological. And just as Russians claim that the United States treats Russia, quote, like a colony, not an equal, unquote, Russia treats its non-Russian neighbors in the post-Soviet space as colonies, not equals. In the 1990s, the Russian media started to propagate a new narrative, which the West did not challenge. The narrative that Russia had been humiliated by the West after the USSR's collapse in 1991, the myth that the former USSR was, quote, the lost territory of historical Russia, and that post-Soviet Russia had the right to play a special role in these areas. And of course, the, uh, the interpretation, which kept being repeated in the course of the 1990s and is repeated even today, is that Russia fears an encirclement of by NATO. The mass acceptance of, his, of these interrelated interpretations have made it difficult for Russians to accept its reduced post-Cold War international status or to reconfigure their post-imperial national identity. So that's, that's kind of the 1990s. And now we come to uh, the beginning of 1999, the beginning of uh, the 21st century, and Vladimir's, Vladimir Putin's ascendancy to the presidency of the Russian Federation. Uh, Vladimir Putin joined Moscow's post-Soviet political establishment in the mid-1990s, shortly after the collapse of the USSR. He did not enter government service with a blank slate. He entered it as an adult, as someone who had formed his vision of the world based on his own experience and based on the experience of Russia uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and in so doing, uh, so he comes to, uh, to the position of the presidency. He is selected by Boris Yeltsin and his advisors. Uh, and Putin spent 16 years in the KGB from 1975 to 1991, with nearly five years in Dresden in East Germany. He went there in um, 1985. He left shortly after the Berlin Wall fell. He left in 1990. And he lived in one of the most repressive countries in East Central Europe. And he lived in a city, Dresden, which was one of the, one of the few um, East German cities which could not receive West German television broadcasting. So, in this five years that he was uh, on assignment in Dresden, he did not really see what other Germans, uh, what even other East Germans might have seen on their television screens. So when the mass anti-governmental protests broke out in East Germany in 1989, and when German crowds attacked the German Ministry of State Security near Putin's Dresden headquarters, he and his KGB team uh, burned secret papers night and day until, by some accounts, the furnace broke. We were afraid, Putin remembered. We were afraid that they would come for us. This fear of personal danger and death was amplified when he could not get reinforcements 
from the nearby Soviet garrison because he did not have Moscow's permission. Moscow, in Putin's words, at this point, was silent. Um, and with this crisis, according to Putin, I got the feeling that the Soviet Union was ailing and that it had a terminal disease without a cure, a paralysis of power. In light of his Soviet upbringing, his experiences in the KGB, at the 1989 events in East Germany, Putin is vehemently opposed to regime change and chaos, which he imagines flows from it. The US-led NATO intervention against Serbia in, on behalf of Kosovo in 1999 the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, the Tulip Revolution in Georgia in 2003, the NATO expansion to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in the spring of 2004, and the US-led invasion or intervention in Libya in 2011 inspired Putin and the Russian political establishment to draw the line on Ukraine in 2004 and then again in 2014. In the course of uh, Ukraine's 2004 presidential election, Putin and his colleagues openly supported Viktor Yanukovych over Viktor Yushchenko. And when the elections took place in uh, uh, October and November of 2004, um, Viktor Yanukovych was announced to be the, uh, the, the winner. Uh, but the United States, the European Union, uh, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, as well as Yushchenko's uh, thousands of supporters, protested this official, uh, these official results, and they put, and Yushchenko's supporters put thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets of Kiev and other cities of Ukraine, and they launched a successful nonviolent. Orange Revolution, which ultimately brought Viktor Yushchenko and Yudit Tymoshenko to power. In 2004, so, so as a consequence of this, in 2004, 2005, Russia bet on the wrong horse and lost. But the Russian leadership uh, proclaimed a somewhat different kind of uh, conclusion from their loss. That is, as expressed by Valery Komyakov, the general director of the Council on National Security, National Strategy, the principle, uh, in his view, of any orange revolution is to overturn the election process. It's not to have a fair election, it's to overturn the election process. The opposition no longer believes that the government can be changed through elections, and quote, if it does not believe that, it thinks, why do we need elections? We will take to the streets and get rid of them. This, according to the prevailing interpretation, is Bolshevism. <laughs> this is Bolshevism. So Putin was not pleased with Yushchenko's government and sought to manipulate the political situation there. Uh, a number of things happened. There were gas cutoffs in 2006 and then 2009. In 2008, uh, President Putin was infuriated over NATO's proposed membership action program for, uh, for Ukraine and for Georgia. Uh, and then in the summer of 2008, Putin, who was provoked by Georgia's President Saakashvili, invaded Georgia in August and occupied Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And then uh, we come to, uh, this, this, this happened in 2008, then in 2011 there's the Arab Spring, the outbreak of the civil war in Libya, uh, the subsequent NATO-led in, uh, intervention there, and then outbreak of a civil war in Syria, Russia's most important ally in the Middle East. All of these events reaffirmed that in the post-Soviet world, everything was quite chaotic and messy. And of course, that Russia was under the threat of, reg of regime change. And if the Arab Spring frustrated 
President Putin and his colleagues, the demonstrations in uh, Moscow in 2011 and 2012, demonstrations against Putin and his candidacy for a third term as president of Russia, uh, shook uh, Putin to the core, it gave him a major diarrhea attack, and it induced him to chart a far more uh, insular course for Russia afterwards. So shortly after the presidential elections in the spring of 2012, Putin sought to discredit those who had rallied against him. He called them um, the, the metropolitan vanguard of the decadent West, that these men and women were unrepresentative of the real Russia, and then the officially controlled mass media launched a new uh, narrative based on the need to protect Russians and the Russian-speaking populations in the year abroad. Uh, the, the Russian media also emphasized the need to promote the idea of Eurasia and the Eurasian Customs Union. And in the wake of Pussy Riot's provocative public protests, the need to defend conservative values as championed by the Orthodox Church. And so, when demonstrations broke out in Kiev in the fourth week of November 2013, shortly after Yanukovych uh, announced that Ukraine would not sign the EU Association Agreement, Putin and his entourage uh, became actively involved in, in Ukraine. When Yanukovych and his inner circle escalated the violence against the demonstrators, and then when in January 2014 the demonstrators responded with violence, Putin began to intervene clandestinely as well as overtly in Ukraine, a country he does not recognize as a legitimate polit political actor independent of Russia. Putin nearly lost Ukraine in 2004. With an Arab Spring type scenario unfolding in Ukraine in 2013, 2000, 14, he would now be more vigilant and take every opportunity to thwart the anti unikovich forces from coming to power. And despite his negative uh, assessment of Viktor Yanukovych, whom he could not stand, if Yanukovych lost power, Russia also lost, as Putin understood the situation. If anti unikovich forces took power, the Russian president would have to introduce measures to limit, if not to subvert, that power. Each of these themes, these tectonic plates, uh, build on and reinforce each other and provide the environment which inform official Russian pronouncements concerning Ukraine and its revolutionary upheavals. As Russia's integration with the West came to an end at the end of the 1990s, Putin formulated and sought to implement four major poli foreign policy goals, which had, which garnered enormous public support. The first goal was to make sure that no major international decision would be taken without Russian participation. So Russia had to be included in all major international decisions. The second um, uh, foreign policy goal was to maintain the status quo in the Euro-Atlantic area and to ensure that there would be no more Eastern enlargements either of NATO or of the European Union in the former Soviet states. The third foreign policy goal was to contain and to push back Western democracy promotion efforts in Russia and in its neighborhood and minimize the possibility of, reg of regime change or instability in Eurasia. And the fourth foreign policy goal was to promote Russia's economic interests and those of its political elite. And if you look at these four kind of foreign policy goals set by President Putin, Ukraine is an important component of at least three of the above four goals. Putin seeks to prevent Ukraine from establishing close ties with the European Union and NATO, and to draw it closer to the Russian Federation. 
um, Moscow authorities seek to establish political control over Ukraine, at least indirect political control, by creating a frozen conflict in eastern Ukraine, similar to those in Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and, of course, Nagorno-Karabakh. For President Putin, who constantly emphasizes the question of Russian national security, Ukrainians and their aspirations to join Western institutions are a serious threat. In um, President Putin's eyes, uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian democracy has betrayed um, Putin as well as Russia. And in dealing with Ukraine, uh, Putin promises that there will be no paralysis of Russian power. Thank you. appreciate the, the history and the more contemporary history of uh, the situation there as well. Um, I did uh, attend, I gather George, you did as well, the election of Poroshenko in May of 2014 and uh, was able uh, to see on the ground uh, some of the emotions that uh, were involved there. There certainly was a major effort 
underway to demonstrate that Ukraine indeed was a sovereign nation and could, dem could uh, prove to the world that it uh, could produce a legitimately elected president. And they did, from what we could observe at that time. Uh, and it may have been the cleanest election they've ever had in Ukraine. Um, I think it's, uh, I've been asked to talk about the U.S. perspective. Um, I can't claim to have been in government uh, for quite a while in the Clinton administration, so uh, I can say whatever I wish to say from the U.S. <laughs> perspective, I guess. Um, it was, of course, very much enlightening to me to be sitting in the seat behind the United States of America at this meeting with 57, actually, Turkmenistan didn't show up, so there were 56 countries around the table in Warsaw, Poland, and uh, a large part of the discussion was uh, the comprehensive approach to security in Europe that the OSCE has taken. That comprehensive approach means both that you respect borders and that you uh, uh, try to achieve some degree of uh, democracy uh, within the countries and respect the human rights. The Helsinki Accords have held for about 40 years and the first violation of territorial integrity really occurred just prior. And of course, the annexation of Crimea uh, was uh, a shocking, uh, I, and I think I'm not, I'm not exaggerating that uh, to most Europeans, it was absolutely shocking to see this happen. You can look at Crimea and say, okay, it used to be part of uh, Russia, uh, the Soviet <coughs> Union, uh, until Khrushchev, declared it was part of Ukraine in 1954. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, that uh, what Russia did, uh, while basically doing what it's doing today, denying that it uh, sent uh, Russian troops there, even though they were already there as part of the naval base, was, was, was a great concern uh, to the, the participants uh, at this conference. I had a meeting earlier today with uh, Layla here and her friend back here from uh, who spent a lot of time in Crimea. Would you raise your hand there just to show us who you are? Thank you. She's the chief of staff to the uh, major Tatar representative in the Ukrainian government and is here as a Humphrey Fellow this year. So I encourage you to <coughs> hear more about the situation in Crimea today, which is very, very, very sad. It's very, very sad. I thought I'd try to give you a, a bit of an understanding of uh, what may be happening at the National Security Council as you try to calculate what Putin will do next. This is a little bit of a story of the tortoise and the hare, uh, because uh, Putin is very much the hare. He doesn't have to worry about whether the Duma is going to approve what he wants to do next. He seems to be very much in charge, or at least until uh, this incident the other day, and I have to say that I was very much involved with people like Jubias and Boris Nemtsov, the man who was assassinated the other day in the 1990s when I was the head of USAID. Uh, we worked very extensively to try to help them make the transformation from the centrally planned economy to a market economy. Boris Nemtsov and Jubias, to be fair, both of them were very enthusiastic about this transformation. And I visited uh, Nemtsov when he was got, the newly elected governor in 1995 of Nizhny Novgorod in his, uh, that particular oblast. And uh, young, enthusiastic, um, courageous, had been transforming a lot of the uh, defense industries uh, into private companies. I'll never forget visiting one that was uh, had made anti-tank missiles out of titanium, and now they were making golf clubs out of titanium. Uh, he took me over to the old Ford factory that had been uh, there since the 1920s, and they were now producing probably the Lada automobile, which wasn't very much to brag about. But uh, he then said in a meeting that we had. Uh, during that visit that the next step he was going to take as governor uh, was to privatize the, the agriculture sector. And he said, you know, you cannot imagine 
how the special interest uh, that dictated what w was going on with the farm cooperatives that, that uh, had a lot of control. He actually made, said basically, I could end up dead as a result of this uh, if I'm not careful about how I go about it. So I think he was well aware through the years, uh, especially as he became a very active opponent of Putin. And of course, he became an advisor to uh, Lushenko when he was the president of Ukraine and uh, had been the vice premier of Russia, had been a minister of energy, and, uh, and was very close to Ukraine as a result of all of this. And of course, was about to hold a demonstration against the Russian policy on Ukraine. Very damaging. Can I say, can anyone say that Putin ordered this? Of course, there's no evidence of this. But I think there's no question that uh, Putin has created through various propaganda machinery, including social media that he has now in Russia, that he created the environment within which Nemtsov, uh, a very loyal Russian nationalist, could be seen as a traitor uh, to his country. And I'm very, very saddened by this because he was a potential leader of the Russia that we all imagined was possible back in the early 1990s. You know, when you, when you think about what the United States can do in this context, uh, obviously you think about the various institutions that can be brought to bear that the United States cares deeply about, uh, the OSCE, uh, the, the big concern that was expressed to me when I went to represent the United States at this meeting was uh, the concern that the OSCE was no longer meaningful in any way. And yet here was the OSCE with monitors on the ground trying to get into the Donbass area, trying to monitor a previous ceasefire. Now they're still trying to monitor and confirm whether or not this ceasefire is actually taking hold, at least in part of that region. Um, the Secretary General, uh, who's an Italian, uh, came to the meeting in, Pol in Poland. And uh, it's a very active organization trying, I guess, as best it can. It was, the auspice it was under the auspices of the OSCE in Minsk, uh, where these agreements have been reached. And it continues to play a very important role. It's the only organization that spans both uh, the former Soviet Union and Europe. I want to go back a little bit into history. George has given us a good, a really excellent uh, uh, dissertation with respect to the history of this, the contemporary history. I think it's very important for people to understand that the Euromaidan uh, was a, uh, an effort by the citizens of Ukraine uh, to attack its government for corruption. And when there was a fascination with the notion of uh, signing an agreement with the European Union, as you suggested, George, um, it was as much because they thought that accession to the European Union would force reform within Ukraine. You know, not even as much uh, a question of whether they politically wanted to be part of Europe, it was more because they thought that they could force their own government to reform. And indeed, that continues to be uh, an issue today. Everyone in Ukraine, whether they were from the West or the East, or whether they were Russian-speaking or Ukrainian or Tatar or whatever, wanted desperately to see that reform occur. And uh, of course, you can look at U.S. policy and you can take the view that John Mearsheimer and others have taken, which is that over time uh, we forced Putin's hand. Well, I can tell you that in the Clinton administration I was always a little concerned about the enlargement of NATO. But it was done very carefully in those days. Uh, it was done, we created a partnership for peace so that the Russia was invited to Brussels for we had joint military exercises so that we could get to know one another in that sense. It wasn't done quite so carefully in the Bush administration, um, not carefully at all. Uh, I, I'm saying this now as an objective uh, academic. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But uh, I mean, when you when you abrogate the ABM treaty right off the bat, when you basically uh, urge Georgia and Ukraine to join NATO and make them accession members, when you place, when you at least get the agreement of Poland and the Czech Republic to place uh, ABM systems uh, right on the border of Russia, you can see where it would cause a, a good deal of paranoia. To suggest, however, that that paranoia is an excuse uh, for what Russia has done in, with respect to Crimea and now in eastern uh, the Donbass region uh, is really uh, pushing the plausibility of an argument to the extreme. Um, I don't know whether or not the events that have occurred in the last week will change uh, Putin's mind, but as the White House and others, and I know it's frustrating for people to watch the, the, the White House. As I said before, it's the question of the tortoise and the hare. Um, it, this, it's not possible to appear dynamic and decisive in this situation. Why? Because you, I, if we're going to continue to have effective sanctions for what the Russians have done, we need the Germans and the French and the European Union. We absolutely have to have them. And these sanctions are beginning to bite. You know, they relate to the energy sector. They relate to the, most importantly, to the financial sector. And of course, the combination of those sanctions and the price of oil has really caused problems uh, within within Russia. Russia, meanwhile, obviously, is trying to turn its economy toward the east, trying to develop more of a relationship with China, but that isn't going to happen overnight, and it may not happen uh, in time for Putin. So it's a question of whether, over time, we can figure out exactly what he wants to accomplish in Ukraine. He's playing a chess game. We're playing a chess game. Only we have five or six hands uh, trying to move the pieces, and he's moving them all by himself. I mean, the question, if you read the Minsk Agreement on the latest ceasefire, you will see that it refers to Donetsk and Luhansk. It doesn't refer to other parts of that region, although there is a ceasefire line that's been drawn. And the question, you know, with respect to the uh, Baltsova, which is a, ready, uh, a, a railroad link between Luhansk and Donetsk. So therefore, it's strategically important if you're trying to establish this nouveau, the new Russia uh, uh, area. Um, Putin claims that that wasn't part of the agreement. All right, well, that's fine. The Ukrainian troops have departed from that town. And of course, there have been attacks uh, further south in Maripol. And there is, of course, the concern that he's trying to build a bridge, a land bridge to Crimea. And of course, to do that would be, I think, a, a real extension of what he can do in the face of uh, what will be a uh, stronger opposition. So the big issue in Washington that everyone talks about in the press is whether, in fact, we're going to uh, provide lethal weapons uh, to uh, Ukraine. We've provided uh, $130 million worth of various equipment, communications equipment. As one of you mentioned earlier, the Ukrainian army does not have modern equipment. It cannot target uh, bombs so that the civilians can, uh, will be, uh, and collateral damage can be avoided. Uh, they don't have that kind of equipment. And it's quite clear a lot of people in Washington believe they should have it, and they should have it soon. The problem is that it might take as long as six months to train people. There's no, if you, if you train people, do you send NATO troops into Ukraine to train them with this, this new equipment? There are serious problems with the Ukrainian military. There is an old Soviet mentality uh, uh, in the way they go about their business. They're not flexible, they're not agile. And they have suffered the consequences of that in the face of Russian uh, modern equipment coming across the border. No one sh should deny that, even though Putin continues to do so. So I think it's a question of watching on a day-to-day -day basis. Meanwhile, the United States has other interests. 
we have an interest in working with Russia on the Iranian nuclear uh, deal. We have an interest, obviously, in making sure that the deterrent value of Article 5 of NATO is worth something. If, if in fact, uh, we stabilize the situation in Ukraine and then move, uh, and Putin decides to move to the Baltics, we've got a real problem. And that's why I think we are, in fact, uh, enhancing the tripwire in the Baltics as we speak, and why there are military maneuvers going on there now to show to show Putin that there is a risk that there's a that trying to imp in in infect his mind with a calculus that says that I can't go any further. So there's a kind of a regional containment policy going on that. If the United States is going to be considering other issues in the world, it has to be a lot more sophisticated than the containment policy that existed in the Cold War. And I, I believe it, it will be, and uh, it will, however, require uh, German and French, uh, especially German and French, participation in this. And frankly, they're fed up. I mean, they're already, I don't, don't think Putin probably fully appreciates the fact that the European economy is beginning to reorient itself. It has been too dependent on Russian energy. It's beginning to figure out, you know, where else can we go? Uh, will the United States um, sign the necessary waivers to sell oil and gas to Europe? And of course, the price of uh, oil coming down has meant that there's a, there's more of that available for Europe at this point. So. These are all things that are part of the calculus. It's a very complicated uh, situation. It isn't as clean cut. Um, I, uh, I think that uh, Ukraine right now is being led by as enlightened a person as they could possibly have found in Poroshenko. As the German ambassador of the OECD said uh, after I dropped off in Paris after coming from the elections. Poroshenko may be an oligarch, but he's someone who really cares about Ukraine. And the question really for Ukraine is to do what Putin doesn't want Ukraine to get away with doing, and that is to reform its economy and to become a success story. That is what Putin wants, uh, very, and he wants that less than anything else in the world. And that's why I think he will possibly satisfy himself with the eastern Donbass region and using that region as a schooled KGB officer would to basically cause problems for the Ukrainian economy as, as we go along. I mean, that may be uh, the most optimistic scenario, uh, but I think the, the United States and Europe have to respond as the IMF did in its $17 billion loan the other day. We have to respond to do everything possible, both to encourage change within the Ukrainian society and the government, and to give them the kind of support that they truly deserve uh, in this case. One thing I would say about your history here, which is sad, and there's probably not a European country that doesn't have some sad history to it as well that they try to obscure as time goes on. And, and that is that the right-wing parties, one is a truly fascist party, which got about a half a percent of the vote, and another is more of a nationalistic right-wing party that got about one and a half percent of the vote in the May election. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know, there isn't, there aren't still those feelings of uh, pride and, and nationalism ask me, the new threat to the world itself is, is nationalism and xenophobia. It's a very serious threat, and uh, it's a, no doubt it exists in Ukraine, but those parties were not successful in playing on that. Uh, the other final thing I will say is that in, in spending the two weeks in Warsaw and watching uh, Russian television and seeing the way the Russians operated at that meeting, and uh, watching the uh, Russia Today, the, the network that's in English, with a lot of American journalists, by the way, who are willing to take money from anyone. 
Um, it's frightening the extent to which they are using the media to make their case. The propaganda, uh, you cannot overemphasize the impact that they've had. When Putin has over 80% popularity rating in Russia, it's because he's bombarding his people with propaganda. But propaganda is a little like heroin. You, you get a high for a while, but it doesn't last. And I'm hopeful that Boris Nemtsov's life wasn't lived for nothing. That, in fact, this could trigger a reaction uh, in Russia. There are a lot of really good people that live in Russia that have, uh, still have the aspiration that Russia can become a modern democratic uh, society. And uh, my hope is that, uh, finally, uh, the, the effect of the propaganda will begin to wear off and uh, anyone who's met anyone who used to take heroin knows how difficult that will be for the society of Russia. Thank you very much.